we're talking about women today. I'm going to put them in their place. <laughs> yeah? Everybody's a little shifty, not sure where we're headed with this now. <laughs> oh, the good news is for the last couple hundred years of our history, we haven't known where to, what to do with it either. You know, there's all kinds of confusion on this particular subject. So uh, last week we, we closed up Romans chapter 16 and verse 2. You know, as I, as I spoke before, we're using chapter 16 of Romans as a, as a platform to, to jump off into this message. Uh, quite frankly, it's backwards to how I would actually preach it, you know, but I'm not God. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we're, it's on the tail end of the Romans series, and it creates a natural subseries. so that's where we're headed. But, but the Apostle Paul, you know, who has the most restrictive writings for women in the entirety of the New Testament, and, and on whose writings for the last couple thousand uh, years-ish, not exactly, that's not exactly true, so don't let me overstate that, Uh, women have been oppressed, we find him in verse 2 of chapter 16, openly commending a woman minister by the name of Phoebe, right? And what what I want you to see as as we continue this journey together is that really... We have to, when we look at the Scripture, and not just on this topic, but, but, on, but on every topic, when, when we look at Scriptures, we, we, we can't take one solitary Scripture, or even a couple, really, quite frankly, and go, oh, look, the Bible says Sean needs a new Corvette. I could probably find one, you know? You know, we, we, we really do have to look, when we study the Bible, we have to look at the entirety of of what it says start to finish. I mean, the Old Testament isn't obsolete. It was actually written to give us instruction, and it lays foundation, you know, for everything that we understand in the New Testament. So honestly, everything that we come to topically should be approached by using the entirety of Scripture. And, and, the, and the, the problem, or I guess the benefit maybe you should say, of, of using this technique, which is the only proper way to study the Bible, is that when you apply it to the topic of women, Paul becomes quite contradictory. It's very quiet in here. He becomes quite contradictory. He, you know, because out of, out of one side of his mouth, he's saying things like, you know, women shouldn't teach and exercise authority over men. And matter of fact, in another scripture, he goes so far as to say, hey, look, shut your mouth. Just don't even talk. When you come through the door, why don't you put your heads down, put your head covering on, keep yourself quiet. You got any questions? Ask your husbands. You know, and whether we like that or not, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Calm down. Seriously, calm down. We, we've, we find in, in other scriptures then, as we've talked about here with him commending you know, Phoebe, who was a deaconess, it, out, of, out of one side of his mouth, he's doing like depleting, restrictive stuff, and, and out of the very other side of his mouth, he's, he's literally walking side by side with female ministers, and, and, the, and not just walking, it's, like, it's not like he's doing it in the closet where he's like, well, secretly, I love you guys, but the culture, you know, it's just, I'm not willing to buck the culture, so I just, you know, it's just between me and you, I want to empower you. You know, but it's going to be a process. You know, it's like this is not what we find with the Apostle Paul. It's not even who he is. You know, and so we find him openly commending women ministers out of the other side of his mouth. As, it, as much of what he would do would be incredibly contradictory. And, and so what I, what I want us to wrestle with in this series primarily is, is this idea that if, if Paul walked alongside and commended female ministers in a variety of different capacities, of which, of course, that's what we're exploring in Romans chapter 16. If, if he did that, his commendation of women speaks very, very loudly to me that there's a strong likelihood that I've misinterpreted the other stri- scriptures that seem to restrict women. Does that make sense? Because, again, the Apostle Paul is not going to be one who says one thing and does something entirely different. That's just, that's just not who we see his character to be in the scripture. And so again, if we see him actually modeling something and his word seems to be different than what he's, than what he's doing, we have to take a minute and pause and, and ask the questions, why is this? How, how could this be? Have I misunderstood something? And, and what is the truth of, of, of what we're really getting at here uh, in the scriptures? Romans chapter 16, starting in verse 3, we find the Apostle Paul yet again uh, commending a, another female who's deeply entrenched in the work of the ministry. It says again, starting verse 3, greet Priscilla. Some of your translations say Prisca. 
uh, that's the same name, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all of the churches of the Gentiles also greet the church that's in their house. Now, Priscilla and Aquila, they were, they were a, a husband and wife team. And, and where previously we saw Paul commending a, a, a single or seemingly single female who's working solo in the ministry, now he's commending to us a, a husband and wife team, a duo. These guys were, were neck and neck. They were doing this stuff together, side by side. Every mention of these guys in the scriptures mentions them side by side. You know, and, and, and so... Not only were they integral and, and, and made a, what would obviously by context here be a huge splash in the Gentile uh, church world, in the Gentile ministry world, they, they were also people who together, as husband and wife, uh, manned their own business. You know, and it was a tent making business. This is where the Apostle Paul actually found them. So, so uh, very quickly on, we learned that Priscilla was not the wife that was staying at home with the children so that her husband could go out and do the work of the ministry. God, that's, that's fantastic. And, and my wife, God bless her, allowed us to do that for the first number of years of, of our marriage. And, and, and I recommend that. I think that's wonderful for, for our children. But, but that's not what we're seeing happen here, right? We have Priscilla and Aquila working side by side in the ministry. And not only in ministry, but they've also planted a business together. And they're working in the business world. So if you will, in the secular world, they're running a business together. And in the religious world... On the religious mountain, they're doing ministry together side by side. What, what fascinates me about this is that, as I noted, or at least alluded to earlier, the Apostle Paul was no stranger to conflict. So if the Apostle Paul was saying a whole bunch of restrictive things for women in ministry, look, I guarantee you this man would have confronted this couple. Priscilla, let me pull you aside. Let me explain a few things. Remember, he did it to the Apostle Peter. Right? Straight to his face, the Bible says, rebuked him in front of everybody. I'm not going to endorse that. <laughs> not suggesting Paul necessarily modeled all the best behavior at every point in his life. We see him as a flawed man just like every other person, right? But to his face rebukes Peter, another apostle, another significant leader in the faith. He had no problem confronting someone who had erroneous doctrine, especially those who would be found in critical positions of leadership in the church. You know, so, so not only did Priscilla and Aquila, uh, and Aquila literally plant multiple churches, uh, one in, in Corinth, they were a part of that. They had a church birthed out of their own house. Again, here we find them in Ephesus, and yet again, another church out of their own house. These are significant leaders making a significant splash in the Gentile church. The Apostle Paul then says, these are actual co-workers with me. He's not even saying these guys were working over there. They were doing their own thing. I saw the good work. That's great. I commend them. He's saying they literally are working side by side with me. They've made a significant splash. And yet we don't find Paul addressing the fact that Priscilla was a significant part of this ministry. More, we actually find him commending that. Does that make sense? Now, we pick up with this couple in Acts chapter 18. Before I say that, there are six Prior, it's not primary, six total references to Priscilla and Aquila in the, in the entirety of the New Testament. Six total references. Four out of the six references to this couple actually lists Priscilla first. Pr it's Priscilla and then it's Aquila. Well, why is that significant? It's significant because in this culture, that would have been extraordinarily uncommon. It's so uncommon, in fact, that the very mention of that, like that, four out of six times in the scripture, seems to indicate that she probably was a dominant figure, actually, in this ministry. She wasn't, she wasn't the secondary, uh, you know, if you will, trying to come in under the covering of her husband, who's the primary minister. By, by mention of the fact that Priscilla was first four out of six, it indicates probably that she was really the dominant factor in that equation, the dominant factor in the ministry. At bare minimum, it suggests that she was at least an equal minister with her husband in the ministry. Now, we see this even in our own culture today, right? Think about it. Think about all of the husband and wife couples that you know. Now, we're not very dogmatic in our culture about pretty much anything. But we're not very, and we're especially not very dogmatic about this particular point. But if you think of all of the husband and wife couples that you know, for the most part, you will put the man's name first. It's Sean and Misty, okay? It's rarely Misty and Sean. 
It's almost always shown in Misty. And you'll find that even in your own lives, in the way that you speak, the, the rare exception to that rule is when you have a couple where the female is more dominant. I can think of 10 right off the top of my head in my own relationship where we always call, and when I'm referencing the couple, we call out the female first. And it's because she's the dominant one in the relationship. Think about the people that you know. See, this even unfolds in our own culture. We begin to see the flavor of that, which probably came direct from the scriptures anyway. So again, Acts chapter 18 and verse 24 says, Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, where Priscilla, and this is my reference here, where Priscilla and Aquila apparently had hosted a church together. So they're a part of a church plant uh, in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. And he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and been fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John, verse 26. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, but then Priscilla and Aquila heard him, and they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now let me ask you, in light of what I said in terms of the cultural inference here, why do you think Priscilla's name was mentioned first in this passage? I would submit to you, that is, in many of the other cases, when it mentions her name first, it's probably indicating that she was the primary one to go after Apollos and to pull him aside. What's she doing? She's in, they, I don't want to mislead you, they together, but she, it would appear, primarily, have pulled aside this man, Apollos, and they are now instructing him in theology. Hey, I want you, to, want you to make sure that you're understanding what's actually happening here. Apollos was a, he, he wasn't some snot-nosed kid, right? He, you know, he just graduates from his, you know, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, and he's out there. He didn't have it all figured out yet, and this is his first gig, you know, and, and Mama Priscilla pulls him aside, right? That's, that's not what's actually happening here. The Scripture says this man was mighty in the Scriptures. He was powerful. He was a powerful, itinerant minister, and you'll remember in the New Testament, at one point in his history, in his ministry, he was actually pitted against the Apostle Paul. Right? Look, I'm of, I'm of Apollos. No, I'm of a, I'm a Paul. See, he was put head to head with the Apostle Paul. This is no insignificant individual. Well, I'm of Bill Johnson. I'm of Randy Clark. Oh, oh, oh look out. You know, it's like they, he was, they were being pitted against each other, which meant in the eyes of the people, these two individuals were equal. Like these were top dogs in the faith. And a woman and her husband pull him aside and begin to instruct him in theology. Why am I making a big deal of that? I'm making a big deal of that because the church for a very long time has suggested that a woman cannot teach a man or have any sort of authority over him. And yet again, to reiterate, we have a very significant individual, a male minister, who is now being instructed in theology by a woman. Again, we find that at very minimum, there are contradictions and what the church has traditionally believed on this subject. Well, so if, if Priscilla is, is teaching a significant figure in the faith, and not even just teaching like, hey, maybe this is how you should handle your children, like teaching in theology, then where does this idea come from that women can't teach men or have authority over them? It comes from 1 Timothy. Let's take a peek. Chapter 2, starting in verse 9. I'm going to read this entire passage, but for the sake of our time today, I'm only just going to be able to scrape the surface, so we're going to wrestle with this over the next couple of weeks or so. Again, in, in verse 9, it starts like this. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments but rather by means of good works, as is proper for a woman making a claim to godliness. Verse 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but it was the woman who was deceived who, who fell into transgression. But women shall be preserved through the bearing of children, if they continue in faith and love 
and sanctity with self-restraint. Holy cow. And that's about the most deflating scripture that you could ever read, isn't it? And so again, <laughs> let me ask you, I mean, that's intimidating, right? I mean, is it just intimidating for me? Because that sounds like a pretty direct word on the subject, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds fairly cut and dry. Women, keep your mouth shut. Don't even remotely think it's possible for you to teach a man, because it's not. Because the Bible just said that, right? So again, let me pose this question to you. How, how is it that the Apostle Paul speaks so restrictively to Pastor Timothy in the church of Ephesus when he doesn't seem to walk that out in any other church or in any other area of his life? I want to commend to you Sister Phoebe, who's a deacon in the church, who we talked about. There's an allowance for teaching and preaching built into that. Extreme qualifications for why that individual would be allowed to hold that position in the church. It's a significant position. You know, I, w- I want to commend to you Priscilla, who pulled this guy aside and taught him more rightly, who, with, along with her husband, has planted a, at least two churches that we know of just in these couple of passages. You know? It, Woman can't teach, have authority, and needs to be quiet. I mean, what do we, what do, we do with that? How do, we, how do we reconcile that? How do we, how do we get our minds around what's, what's happening with the Apostle Peter and, 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 and why he would say something so seemingly restrictive and off the wall compared to his life and what he was living? What do you, what do, you do with that? Well, you can't ignore it. Can I just submit that to you? And that's what our tendency has been. But we're just going to ignore it. We're going to take it at face value. And uh, we're going to, you know, restrict women and see how this works. We don't understand what to do with the multitude of contradictions. But, you know, it says what it says. So that's what we're going to work with. Right? Let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one. Do you think that if the Apostle Paul in his own life and in the walking out of his ministry the one who is co-laboring with other women who he publicly commends to the world. Do you think it's possible that that man who's living one thing and saying here apparently something entirely different, do you, do you think it's possible that maybe it doesn't say what we think it says? Is, is it possible that we've maybe misinterpreted the scripture? Gosh, it doesn't seem like it. It seems very plain to me. But is it possible? Yes. It is possible we've misinterpreted. Let me ask you another question. What's the purpose of an epistle? An epistle is, is a letter that the apostles wrote. In fact, predominantly, uh, if not exclusively, the apostle Paul wrote to local churches 2,000 years ago with their own cultural dynamics, their own issues, their own questions, their own problems, and they were written in another language, <laughs> right? And retranslated into English from, you know what I mean? Like, like there's, so, but, there, but ultimately at the heart, they were letters that the apostle wrote to a very specific church with very specific problems and a very specific culture and a very specific point in history. Is that enough clarifiers for you? <laughs> with the intent to show them how to walk out the faith in their specific context. So then I have to ask you, what is the context? And if you don't know the answer to that, there's no possible way you can draw the right conclusion just by reading a seemingly contradictory scripture placed in the middle of the Bible that doesn't seem to jive with the rest of the Word of God. There's no way you can come to the proper conclusion unless you actually look at the multitude of variables that were at play that would cause the Apostle Paul to say something so seemingly restrictive. So what was happening then? So what's the context? Now, if you read your scripture well, you'll, you'll remember that you know, Ephesus was a, was a tremendous city. You know, at the, at the heart of the city was this, was this ginormous temple uh, made to Artemis. The, uh, the Greek, uh, I get it mixed up because there were so many cultures that were all like 
that came together there, and some called Diana, and there were different things, and Artemis, and they merged it all together, so forgive me if it sounds a little bit convoluted, but they had this, this huge, huge temple. In fact, it was the largest building in the entire region. It was one of the, the seven wonders of the ancient world, like no insignificant temple there in the middle of this city. And uh, it's, it's interesting because while this was a tremendous stronghold in the city of Ephesus, you find the Apostle Paul rolling through with a very effective evangelistic ministry. And people in this culture, they begin to convert from Artemis' worship to God, the one true God, okay? They begin to convert, but the problem is they're converting with a tremendous amount of baggage, just like all of us in this room, right? And this baggage happened to be female-specific baggage. What I mean by that is this. The temple at Artemis was completely run by female priests. There weren't any men involved in it. They were all women. In fact, it was like power to the women type of stuff. You know, the, the statue of Artemis actually has a crown on the top of the woman's head meant that she's the one who's rightfully supposed to rule. And, and not only were the, were, 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 was it all a, a huge women-based thing that was happening, they were also beginning to teach that women should be usurping the authority of men. They were, they were going so far in their teaching to actually to actually say that the woman was created first and then the man, which we know is very much contrary to the story that we have in the book of Genesis. Further, the women, the infant mortality rate being what it was, the women were calling out to Artemis who would then uh, protect them supposedly uh, as they were giving birth, as they were beginning to rear their children. So all of this is going on in the background to include the fact that the priests that manned this temple and all of the priestesses who were the, who were the temple prostitutes began to, uh, in, in, partially because of the wealth of the trade, began to array themselves and find jewelry and gold and pearls, which at this time were the most extravagant piece of jewelry that you could, that you could wear, that you could have. Very, very costly when it talks about a reference to pearls here. So the finest clothing they could wear and, the, and gold necklaces and pearls, and they would, they would braid their hair and they would weave like a gold inlay into their hair and all of this was meant to identify them as a prostitute it's not unlike if you were in the inner city today and you were driving down and you saw a couple of ladies walking the street and based on their attire you would make the assumption oh I'm guessing those are probably prostitutes see their attire gives them away in the culture. You understand? Okay? So this is all of the stuff that's in the background happening at Ephesus at the time that he comes <laughs> to give a very specific word to a very specific church with very specific cultural baggage issues from the women who were getting saved, who were used to being a part of the Artemis temple worship ministry. Okay, a very specific set of baggage that the Apostle Paul begins to address. So with some of that foundation laid, let's take a look at it again. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Likewise, he says, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as is proper for a woman making a claim to godliness. Now look, at first glance, we take a look at this and we go, not bad advice, right? I mean, can we all concede there's a good universal principle in here? Don't dress like a prostitute. I think that's probably pretty good advice for the church of God. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just going to submit that to you, right? You know, but, but, but more generally speaking, look, women... Don't, don't come in here into this family and make sure your makeup is, is all perfect and beautiful and your hair is done just right and your clothes are just so, 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 so as to cover up the insecurities that are deep in your heart. God's not concerned about the way that you dress. He's not concerned about the makeup on your face. And God bless you. Those are great things. I have no problem with that. And the Bible doesn't have problems with those things. But God's looking for the heart. And we can't use all of this to cover up what's actually happening on the inside such that we refuse to be vulnerable in our relationships with one another to reach out for help and to actually advance into healing rather than trying to keep a facade that makes it look like I'm the perfect Christian family. Right? 
See, so there are, there are timeless principles at play in these scriptures, but, but what I want to draw our attention to for the sake of today's message is, I think braided hair is hot. <laughs> no, actually, I don't at all. <laughs> I say, I don't at all, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and clearly, you know, I, I, I'm being facetious, but I, I don't know, the last time I ever saw a young lady going to her first prom, you know, who decided to put herself into two pigtail braids, you know, I'm going to get dressed up, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go the best that I can go, I'm going to two pigtail braids, dad, can you help me out with this? I'm not sure that's the best look for you, sweetie, right? You know, usually we, we, we end up arriving at a different place. Ladies, tell me if I'm wrong. That, you know, if we're wanting to look the nicest we can look, pigtails probably aren't the, the way you're going to go. You're probably going to, you know, go down to the stylist and she's going to do something amazing and put your hair up and put flowers in, right? You know, so, so culturally speaking, braided hair for us is the day that you're wearing sweatpants, not a prom dress. Okay, it, it, it doesn't mean anything, and it's not immodest, not even if a prostitute's wearing it, right? And so, so it's easy for us to take a look at these restrictive scriptures and go, oh, shit, braided, braided hair. You know, how many of you ladies are wearing gold today? Yeah, okay, so like five of you, I'm guessing there's some nervous hands. They're like, I don't know, he's going to kick me out. I don't, know, I don't know what he's doing right now. You know, my, my, my point in, in calling you, you out in that way is, is simply to say it, it's not immodest in our culture. And so for us, it's easy for us to read these scriptures and go, okay, braided hair, gold crosses. I mean, hello, that's like Christian culture 101, right? You know, it's like that, thing, that doesn't mean anything to us, but there's a greater principle and we can kind of get a hold of this. Here's what bothers me. We're so quick to relegate these scriptures, verses 9 and 10, as culture and go, <laughs> of course I'm, I'm going to braid my hair and wear sweatpants. It's coffee day. <laughs> but then the very next verse says this, verse 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. And somehow, as a culture, we have locked tight on this one here on these two verses in the middle, and we've said, oh, that, that's a universal principle for every culture for the rest of our lives. Yeah. <laughs> Braided hair, Psst, that's so silly and stupid. Women teaching in their gift, the gift that God has given them, nope, can't do that. Why is it that we're so quick to relegate verses 9 and 10 to culture, but we completely take the verses 11 and 12 out of context, and we put the most massively restrictive uh, you know, bondage on women for all of culture, for all of time? This is a universal command of God. I'm sorry, ladies, whether you're gifted or not, the Scripture says that you can't exercise any authority, that you've got nothing to offer men. Braided hair, do whatever you want, but you're not going to teach me. I mean, come on, let's wake up. If there was a cultural context, like the, the Apostle Paul literally hasn't even taken a breath yet. Do you see that? In the same breath, if there was a cultural context for 9 and 10, there must likewise be a cultural context for 11 and 12. There has to be. It hasn't separated like that. It's in the same breath, in the same culture, with the same issues and the same people. He hasn't, even, he hasn't even closed his mouth yet. And somehow, we as a church, we've taken and we've dichotomized these things. No, culture doesn't apply to this. We don't really want women to be empowered and to teach and to have any authority over men because we're intimidated by that. We actually want to we dominate them and we want to lead the world. Oops, I may have stumbled onto an age-old agenda. There were things happening in the culture that dictated this response from the Apostle Paul. Women, seriously, I, I, I see you out there. You're all adorned with stuff just like you were when you were working the temple. I just want to let you know, your value here isn't in all of that. Your value is because Jesus set a price on you that was priceless. You don't have to do all of that here. And... Because in the culture, you've, gotten, you've bought into this indoctrination of like woman power, women are going to lead the world, and we're going to suppress men such that we're even now teaching that women were made first and men second. 
you're probably going to have to sit out there just for a little while until you've had enough time to receive proper instruction and to renew your mind. Because I can see the baggage of the world all over you. And eventually, Church of Ephesus, I'm going to be able to stand publicly before the entire world with words breathed by the Holy Spirit and say, I commend to you before God some of these women ministers who came out of all of that stuff and who I present to you today as being fully renewed, powerful women who are leading beside me, co-working with me, co-laboring and ministering in the faith, planting churches and missionaries and doing all the stuff, right? See, because it's a process. We all start somewhere. And the Bible is quite specific that not everybody, when they first get converted, gets thrown into eldership in a church. There's a process. There's something that has to work itself out. And that's what these scriptures are talking about. See, there was a context, and it made sense within that context. And that's why, in that context, the Apostle Paul could place restrictions on those who rightfully needed to be restricted. And over in this church could empower those who rightfully needed to be empowered. Do you see that? There is no contradiction in Scripture. There's only us as a 2,000 year later Western church viewing the word that we're reading that wasn't even written in our culture or in our language with our own Western mindsets and with our goggles for what we think it says based on our culture. That's actually the problem. Is this making sense to anybody today? Perfect timing. We've got a lot to talk about, even in this scripture. But I hope that you're beginning to see the outline of the truth behind why it was written and what it actually says. And women, I'm telling you, it's my heart that you're, that another layer of disempowerment is peeled off of you. And and it's my prayer that another layer of disempowerment is peeled off of me. Because it's still difficult for me to see a woman as a senior pastor. Ooh, let's get to the truth of it. Because my culture has dictated for a very long time that that's not the biblical standard. And so while I know it here, it's taken me a little longer to get it here. You see what I'm saying? And while you won't see me bring hard restrictions, still on the inside I wrestle. And I go, okay, God. And I'm praying for all of us. Another layer of that wrestling is peeled off so that 50% of the body can be empowered and reinstated to their godly purpose and God's intention for them. Yeah? This is going to be a good series. Every seat out there should be filled with women who you know who have been oppressed and disempowered. Invite them. Father, we welcome you. We welcome your kingdom ways, and we desperately want your kingdom ways, your views. We want to understand scripture. God, I don't want to stand up here ever and make up something just because I want to see women empowered. And so I'm getting, I come before you, even humbly before this crowd, and I say, I submit every word to you. I submit every, the way that I view these scriptures, the, the people I'm feeding from, the, the interpretations, the conclusions that I come to, I submit them wholly to you. And I say, God, I'm committed to upholding your standard and your standard alone, even if I don't understand that standard. You know, I, we welcome truth here. We're investigating these scriptures in depth to find truth. And we're asking at the same time, God, that you would dismantle the arguments of men, the misinterpretations of men, and the, the oppression that's come at the hand of men. Would you dismantle that? Would this be a house that empowers everybody? Would this be a house in whom the scripture, you know, who is set free is free indeed, equally applies to men and women and white people and black people and Mexicans and Jews alike, that who has been set free is free. Free indeed. No limitations, no restrictions. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless.